Hi guys! Welcome back to my channel. Today I have a very special guest to introduce you to, Keith Collins. Now, Keith and I went to school together at Indiana University, and last month, if you've been keeping up with me on Instagram or Twitter, or maybe even Snapchat, then you already know that we were lucky enough at Jacksonville State University to have his Baroque Ensemble Echoing Air in residency. This meant that he was available to do master classes for our bassoon studio on historical instruments as well as historical repertoire. Because Keith and I are dear friends, I asked him if he would be willing to share some of his generous knowledge base with you guys on YouTube. And he said yes. So this week as well as next week are going to be a two-part series dedicated to Keith Collins' master class at Jacksonville State University. This first part is going to focus on the Baroque instruments as well as the modern reproduction. Next week, we'll focus on 19th century bassoon innovations, as well as the repertoire of the Baroque and early classical era. So if you want to make sure you don't miss next week's video, be sure to click that subscribe button. And if you like hearing the Baroque bassoon that is in the opening, as well as the segue, that too is Keith Collins, so do make sure to check him out on SoundCloud. If you are very inspired and you want to study with him, you can always go to Indiana University, my alma mater, and check him out. We all know about bassoons, they come in four pieces, right? Um, what we don't necessarily think about is what a radical idea this was back in about the year um, 1680 something or other. So we have the kirtle or the dulcian, which is the precursor to this instrument. It's made of one piece of wood. They would take a big old log and imagine it like this, and they would drill two parallel bores all the way through, right? Then they would, on one end, they would drill this way. That would connect the two bores, right? And so then they would just simply stop up the two holes on the outside, right? And then you've got a U-bend, but it's like, a, it's like at right angles. The deal was that if you had this big instrument one piece of wood, if something broke, you were completely screwed because you, it was really hard to get these things fixed. Really cool instrument, lots of solo rep for this thing, and chamber music rep. Actually, we don't get as much of that stuff until we end up in like the classic era. Um, they came in different sizes, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and great bass. The soprano is awesome. A pocket bassoon, I can like, you know, literally put it in a backpack and just like... It's 1660. Um, you are a musician in the court of Louis the Fourteenth, right? And he's the Sun King, all powerful, and he hires this Italian guy. You may have heard of him, Jean Battista Lully. And so Lully had the great idea. He's like, "Hey, why don't all of my string players like have the same down bows of bows?" This was like radical. And also, I want to use the woodwinds. They had up until this point been an outside thing, or if they were inside, they were like separate. They didn't ever play together because the pitches were different. So woodwinds back in like the 15, 1600s were pitched really high. Like um, some of the dulcians we have are as high as uh, A480. Uh, more normal is like A460. So if you then wanted to play with at French pitch, it was A at least 392, maybe A407, something like that. We're talking about like a minor third off. So you had to do something. Um, you could either write your parts in two different <laughs> keys and hope for the best. Uh, or you could redevelop the winds, and that's eventually what happened at the French court. They took the old shams, the really loud, turned those into oboes, and they turned, turned the fifes into transverse flutes, and then they turned the big shams into this bassoon. And so they figured out at some point, we don't know who, we don't know exactly when, to build this thing in parts. So this instrument is a copy uh, made by Guntram Wolf in Germany. His firm, he's now passed on, but his son is still going strong. And uh, it's a copy of an instrument originally probably from about 1700-ish, maybe 1690, something like that. German, but we don't know who he was. We only have his initials, H-K-I-C-W. I love it because it has like several of the letters for Heckel in there, but it's not really, so. <laughs> Super light, maple, just like everything else we know about. These are brass. There's no lining in the bore, of course. This hasn't been invented yet. The original to this instrument, this joint is missing. But there are several instruments like this that are anonymous that may be by the same guy where they survive, so these, this has been sort of substituted in. Obviously the Baroque era wasn't just about function, it was about form, they wanted to make them all pretty and all this stuff. The 
the French were the first to have these instruments. It first turns up about 1675 in some operas and stuff. Not long after that, we end up with um, some guys in uh, Nuremberg, Germany, who petition the local... This, these are uh, professional instrument builders, and they petition their local guild, their, their union, like, hey, we want to copy these French instruments. They're really cool. It was like totally like the thing to do. You're like, oh, so you want to have a good wind band? Well, let me tell you, go with the French things and put them in with the strings. It's fantastic. Like, it was like, you know, this huge thing. And so all of, like, the little princes and princesses and minor earls and dukes wanted to have their own court band with these new instruments. So uh, the German Union said, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead and make these things. Um, what are the French going to do, like, sue us? Uh -huh. uh, but the French instruments were a little bit plainer, actually. And so in order to make them look more attractive, the Germans put all these little baubles on them. Um, the early French instruments don't have those. We don't have any surviving instruments from France. They all got burned up or whatever during the various and sundry revolutions that happened. Um, but we have several drawings and other paintings and stuff. But uh, this is a real popular design in Germany. It lasted until at least the 1730s or 40s or later. Uh, Bach probably knew an instrument about like this, uh, give or take. Um, there's a couple of other instruments that he's a, that Bach you know, was associated as instrument builders. I have five keys. Um, one of them is not present on the original instrument, but it's sort of essential, and it's the E flat key. Open it there. French bassoons feel and sound much more like these instruments do. It's a more transparent sound. The whole issue about why this thing is called a fagotto or a fagot is a is a big old can of worms. For years, I know I always learned, you know, because when it's in its case taken apart, it looks like a bundle of sticks. And a word for a bundle of sticks is fagotto or faggot or f uh, fagot. The problem is this: the earliest bassoons that we know of. Um, and even some of like the, the dulcians and curdles that were made in one piece weren't called that, or weren't called dulcian, they were called fagotto. And so it's a bit of a, a problem trying to figure out what why, why this is. The first evidence we get of these dulcians, these really early bassoons, are from the 1530s. No instruments, but we have organ stops in Germany that say uh, uh, dulcian, and that means this instrument. Um, but even that early, there's still some references to fagot, fagotto. Maybe it meant, you know, the, the instruments in the Renaissance came in consorts. Have you heard this word before? Mm -hmm. A group of instruments of the same size. Maybe they were all in a case together, and that looked like a bundle of sticks, maybe? But it's it's very curious, and it's caused lots of, not fist fights, Bach style, but lots of arguments among musicologists about what this is, what this is really all about. What we can say for sure is that composers knew the limitations of these instruments, and they used those. So when we talk about Telemann F minor here in a minute, you will find out when I try to play a little bit of it what it's a big deal. It's actually one of the hardest pieces to play on this instrument. <laughs> So it's, it doesn't need the, the whole dual thing, you know, it doesn't... I find that when I do have a, a, a read that does the, the dual crow, the, the two pitches or so on, that you expect or want on a modern read, that it usually means it's not a good bird read. <laughs> I can do it on this if I force it, but I mean. The problem, of course, in playing these old instruments is that we don't have any instruments that survive intact with their original reeds and their original crooks. First thing you do, like, pitch goes up. And we all know this, like, 440 is the usual thing here, but in Europe it's now up to 442 point something, right? And it's going to continue to rise, probably. Which, the strings love it. I sound so bright and pretty. And then one was like, God, <laughs> now what do I do? Because you can't, as you all know, you can't vary it by that much, necessarily. So the first thing you do is you chop off part of your crook. <laughs> and just make it shorter and hope for the best. It only works up to a certain point. We know a good bit about the bores of the instrument, the inside diameters and stuff, and the key work. And what we don't know about is things like the thickness of the walls of the book and how long they were. General consensus right now, and those of us that care about this kind of thing, is that our, our crooks are a little bit too short probably. They should be a bit longer. And this maker provides, you can order longer or shorter crooks just like you can for, uh, for your heckle style bassoons. Because these instruments are like unlined bore and the bore is quite large, you gotta, I've got to, I'm really flexible with the intonation. <laughs> What that means is that you have to be super careful the way you play. You know, it's bad enough with a modern bassoon, right? Like especially like G and F and F sharp. Um, on these instruments, it's even even trickier. I hope.
hope you guys enjoyed this. It's a little bit much to take a two hour lecture and try to mosh it down into two 10 minute videos, but I hope you enjoyed it and you'll tune in for next week. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up and be sure to click that subscribe button so that you don't miss out. I will see you guys next time. Bye. I like starting off with fast air because it gets everyone breathing low and deep from the very get go. So fast air. Gives me that wind blown look, doesn't it?